Visionem quam vidistis nemini dixeritis done camora tuis resurgat filius homini. Hello, everyone. Uh, come here. Oh. So that was just my natural projection. Can you hear me now? All right. So hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is Cole DeSantis. I am a uh, public speaker, researcher, writer who specializes in theology. Uh, I'm also a journalist with the Rhode Island Catholic. Some of you may remember me from, uh, there was a few events here that I covered back in, I believe, was it last summer or last fall? I believe uh, Father McMahon in his pastoral installation, I was the one who covered that event. Um, and back a few months ago with uh, Bishop Henning's pastoral visit, uh, I was the one who covered that. And I'd say this is a beautiful parish. I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Dennis Souza and Father McMahon for inviting me out here today to give this talk. But before I go any further, let me give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I received both my BA and my MA in theology from Providence College. And one thing that I noticed over the course of my studies was that there's a lot of high-level theological concepts that are really important to understanding the faith. And unfortunately, these ideas really aren't being explained to the average, everyday Catholic in ways that they can understand. And the more I began to study theology, the more I began to just have my mind blown by the profundity of the faith and began to realize the discrepancy between what was being taught in the ivory towers of academia and what was sometimes being taught from the pulpit. And so I made it my mission to sort of take these high-level theological concepts and sort of present them to the average everyday person in ways that they can understand. And this really showcases the importance of knowledge in the spiritual life. Now, of course, you know, some people may ask, if I don't have a bachelor's degree, three master's degrees, five PhDs, a doctor of divinity, if I didn't get into the pontifical you know, University of St. Thomas Aquinas, am I going to get into heaven? The answer, of course, yes. There's no minimum required amount of knowledge to get into heaven. But the thing is, there's nothing wrong with having, or rather, there's no issues that ever come about from having too much knowledge. See, the thing is, the Bible is a dense text, right? It's not even really one book. It's really a library of texts. That's the analogy used by people like uh, Bishop Barron. It's really more like of an anthology of texts. A series of different texts written over the course of thousands of years by dozens or hundreds of different authors writing within the context of different you know, circumstances to audiences facing different spiritual issues. And then, of course, you have the Code of Canon Law, the Catechism, the writings of the saints, the writings of the popes and the church councils, which can also be theologically dense texts. The thing is, the Bible and sacred tradition lays the basis for what we believe. I mean, by agreeing to become, by becoming Catholic and by remaining Catholic, we are essentially saying, I'm agreeing to believe in this set of texts. You know, and then when you look at the Catechism, or the writings of the popes, or the writings of the saints. That provides the framework that sort of helps us to interpret it. And so, if you don't really understand the Bible, or the writings of the great saints, or the popes, or the councils, basically what you're saying is, it's okay for me to claim to believe in X without really understanding X. You see, the more you delve into scripture, the more you delve into the writings of the great saints and theologians and the popes and the councils and, you know, the catechism, the more tools you're getting 
to try to fight the good fight. And life is a fight. It's a battle between good and evil. And you've got to have the right tools to be able to continually move forward in that fight. The minute you adopt this attitude of, eh, you know, I'll leave all this high-level theological stuff to those to the priests or to those naughty bookworms in the theology department, you've kind of set yourself off on the wrong path. There's a quote from the prophet Hosea, and it wasn't a directly a quote from the prophet Hosea. It was God speaking through the prophet Hosea. So the book of the prophet Hosea, chapter 4, verse 6, God says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. You know, if you don't understand the faith, you're not understanding the most fundamental truths of reality. Those truths which help us to find meaning. Those truths which help us to discern right from wrong. I mean, think about it. Even just to, to wake up in the morning and say your prayers and think to yourself, hey, today I hope I do the will of God. You know, I'm going to try to discern the will of God and I'm going to do it this day. Even then, you've already, on some level, have accepted the notion that God exists. You've, um, you've in, by, in the vision that you have of God, you've either consciously or unconsciously internalized a specific vision of God. And so simply by believing in God and having a specific understanding of who God is or what the will of God is or this concept of the will of God, you've already accepted certain knowledge, you've accepted certain truth claims. And you can't, there's no such thing as being completely neutral because every single day we make decisions and our decisions are guided by certain principles. And the, whether or not our actions lead to salvation, lead to deeper union with Christ, uh, help us fulfill the twofold end of the Christian, love of God and love of neighbor. Well, how, good these, how well these principles lead to that end is based on the strength of the tools we have to figure out whether or not a specific action leads us down that path. And in fact, one of the greatest tools that we as Catholics and Christians have to really live out the Christian way of life is prayer. We all pray, right? But in order to pray, we have to understand what prayer is. You know, we have to understand what sorts of prayer are most in line with the sort of mindset or teachings of Christianity, with the spiritual worldview put forward in Scripture. Because think about it. There's, I'm guessing all of you know about Padre Pio. He was one of the greatest mystics of the 20th century. A wealth of spiritual wisdom. And he had a quote. Those who pray have hope. Those who pray little are in great danger. Those who do not pray are lost. Now obviously, we are saved by the grace of God. That's the indispensable you know, ingredient. We don't have the grace of God. Nothing else we do will help us get into heaven. But humans have free will. We have the ability to cooperate with, to either accept or reject the gifts of God. And we have a duty to harness, to make use of the spiritual gifts which God gives us, and to ask for them if we don't have them. And one of the greatest ways we do, do so is through prayer. So, let's begin with a walking definition of prayer. So obviously, the fact that you guys are here implies that obviously most of you are religious, right? And which implies most of you pray on a fairly regular basis. So, how would you guys define prayer? So who here wants to define, even just in vague terms, the Catholic view on prayer? Yes? So communication with God. That's actually a really good answer. Anyone else? So the gentleman back there said, prayer is communication with God. And if I ever had to put forward a sort of quick, to the point, sort of walking definition of prayer, it would be that. One, prayer, one definition of prayer I heard frequently growing up was prayer is talking to God, right? And 
it kind of makes sense why Padre Pio would say what he said. I mean, we hear Protestants all the time saying, we Catholics don't read the Bible. If you read the Bible, you know that in the letters of St. Paul, it says, it is by grace you are saved, not from yourself, not by your own works. Now, obviously, Padre Pio, being a priest, he knew the Bible, right? But why would he say what he said if he knew what St. Paul taught? Well, think about this way. Imagine if you never talked to your best friend or to your spouse. Imagine if you never spoke to your children or to your parents. Can any relationship really thrive or flourish apart from that? Not really. So likewise, do you expect our relationship with God to be any different? I mean, imagine if we never really spoke to God. Imagine if when we did speak to God, it was very just casually, just, you know, half-heartedly. I mean, when we pray, we have, there has to be a mindset of placing ourselves at the foot of the divine throne. Acknowledging our utter dependence on God, but also recognizing that God is all good. And so, when we think about the fact that God is all good, this leads in a bunch of different directions. For example, with penitential prayer, we recognize that maybe we didn't obey God as much as we ought to, but we trust in His mercy. We know that God is the highest authority, but he's also a merciful Lord, so we can approach him. But again, how can, you, how can you ever ask someone for forgiveness unless you have open and constant communication with them, right? Well, when we ask God for stuff, like think about that would be called um, prayer, petitionary prayers. How can you ask for God's blessings without constant or frequent communication with them. So as, even just the act of asking God for something is a form of communicating with God. Or you see prayers where you aren't even so much asking God for something or, you know, showcasing signs of repentance. Maybe you're just contemplating the things of God or some good that God has done for you. But again, this implies that God isn't so far away that he can't be known by any way, by any means. There has to be some level of, you know, communication, some level of self-disclosure between us and God. Now, from this kind of general definition of prayer, prayer as talking with God, we can kind of get a more specific definition of prayer. How many people here have heard of uh, the Catholic Encyclopedia? Just a show of hands. How many people? So some of you? So the Catholic Encyclopedia, I mean, it's literally an encyclopedia, and it's published back in the early 20th century. Uh, it basically contains a list of the names of important theological concepts and people and events from the life of, from the history of the Catholic Church. It's actually one of the, um, one of the best known uh, reference texts within Catholicism. And in the entry for prayer found in the Catholic Encyclopedia, it defines prayer in the following way. Prayer is, quote, an act of the virtue of religion. So let me break it down for you. In the Catholic tradition, there's two sets of virtues. Now, a virtue is basically a good act. And people tend to misunderstand what is meant by the term habit. So the term habit comes from the Latin term habitus, which means inclination or disposition. It's a human type free will. But whenever you make a specific choice or a set of choices, you know, over and over and over again, our wills become disposed to then acting in similar ways in the future. So a habit isn't just a mindless sort of little tiny action that we do kind of unknowingly. Like let's just say every time I walked up this aisle, I touched the top of that pew right there. And I did that over and over and over again. And eventually, now I'm walking down the aisle, and I do that without even really thinking about it. Now that kind of 
shares a similar psychological root as the concept of habits in the moral sense. But from a purely ethical perspective, that's not what we mean by habit. A habit is basically a broad pattern of behavior, right? It's a broad sort of pattern of behavior that defines our character, our actions, our intentions. It's more akin to what people today would call a personality trait, right? Or a character trait. Virtues are good habits. Vices are bad habits. And in the Catholic tradition, there's two sets of virtues. One type of virtues, the theological virtue. Now, theological obviously means of or having to do with God. And these virtues are given to the soul by grace. To use this sort of high-level theological jargon, they're infused into the soul by grace. That is to say, we don't naturally have the ability to perform or carry out these virtues. Rather, the soul has the ability to produce these virtues because of grace. There are three theological virtues, and they're mentioned in the Bible. And everyone probably knows the verse that lays the basis for these virtues, but would anyone like to take a guess to what the, the three theological virtues are? Say again? Yes, faith, hope, and charity. So those are the three theological virtues. But then, there's a, the other set of virtues, the natural virtues, sometimes called the moral virtues. And the natural virtues, or the moral virtues, basically refer to those virtues that we have an inherent capacity to live out. Like we're born with the capacity to live in accordance with these virtues. Now, some, when we really get into the, the nitty-gritty of it all, people will sometimes use the words natural virtue and moral virtue in slightly different ways, uh, where the term moral virtue can sometimes be used in a, as something distinct from natural virtue. Natural virtue can just sometimes mean if God leaves you to your own devices, what, what's your, what capacity for virtue would you have? Just as a sum aggregate result of all of your actions, Whereas the term moral virtue, there can be two types of moral virtues. The natural virtues, in the sense I just talked about, and then you have the infused moral virtues, which is basically the concept of like, grace doesn't just add something to the soul beyond what it naturally has. Grace also sort of elevates, it heals human nature, because human nature is corrupted by sin. So our natural capacity for virtue, as healed and elevated by grace, is what is called the infused moral virtues. The reason why some people use the terms natural virtue and moral virtue kind of interchangeably is because the one thing that both of these virtues have in common is that there's something in the human person where we just sort of, by definition, as humans, have the capacity to live in accordance with these virtues. Like these virtues considered in and of themselves are something that even someone without grace could potentially have. Whereas the theological virtues, nobody has these virtues apart from grace. Now, when you talk about the natural or the moral virtues, there's a set of four of them, known as the cardinal virtues. And the term cardinal comes from the Latin term cardo, which means pivot or hinge, the cardinal virtues are the four virtues that really lay the basis for all the other natural virtues. They are justice, prudence, which is sort of like practical moral wisdom. You then have moderation, also known as temperance. And then you have the virtue of... Damn, slip in my mind. <laughs> I have... Justice, prudence, moderation, and fortitude. Yes, all courage, also known as courage. So those are the four cardinal virtues. So you have the four cardinal virtues and the three theological virtues. Every other virtue that exists is either derived from 
variant of or based on one of those seven virtues. So let's kind of, what does any of this have to do with prayer? So let's go back to the definition of prayer found in the Catholic Encyclopedia. Prayer is an act of the virtue of religion. And the virtue of religion is basically a subset of the virtue of justice. Justice is the virtue whereby we maintain right and order relationships with one another. So, for example, a big part of justice is giving others what they are owed. Giving other, um, the classical definition is you give to a person what they are due. And the virtue of religion is basically justice in our relationship with God. It's justice ordered towards God. And so, basically, we owe God certain things as our Lord and Savior, as our Creator. And when we give unto God what is owed to God, that is the virtue of religion. And prayer is but one way of expressing or living out this virtue. Now, how does prayer express the virtue of religion, and thus, by extension, the virtue of justice? Well, when you look at, for example, petitionary prayers, we are, and again, petitionary prayers are prayers where we ask God for his blessings. With petitionary prayers, we are, at least implicitly, recognizing God as the creator and sustainer of all that exists, and thus we are admitting of our utter dependence on him. With prayers of thanksgiving, we are thanking God for the blessings that he has already given us, and therefore we are giving God what he is owed. God is owed our gratefulness because of the gifts that he has given us, and so we are giving God what he is owed. And very often, one part of prayers of thanksgiving are, you know, just more general sentiments of praise and honor, which is also something that we owe God, because to the extent that a thing is good, it is deserving of praise. And who is more deserving of praise than a being who is infinitely good and the source of all goodness? So prayer is essentially in a word an expression of the virtue of religion. Yet, there's a more general definition of prayer that we could also use. To go back to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it says that another level to the definition of prayer is, quote, the application of the mind to divine things, not merely to acquire a knowledge of them, but to make use of such knowledge as a means of union with God, unquote. So, essentially, the core of prayer is contemplating the things of God. Not just for the sake of knowing stuff about God, but for the sake of using this knowledge as a way to deepen our relationship with God. Because think about it. I venture to say, and this is a sentiment I believe we could all agree on, not just all of us here, but... You look at, like I remember on the way here, I passed a Baptist church and an Episcopalian church. This is something we would agree in with them. And if you look at all the people out there who don't believe in God, this is something us and the non-Christians would agree in, or the non-Catholics would agree in with the atheists. And everyone, I think one of the number one moral responsibilities we have is the duty to discern the truth, to seek the truth, to seek the good, and then to accept the good upon finding it. And there's lots of goods out there. There's lots of good things in the world. But wouldn't you say that if there is a such thing as a supreme good, as a source of our goodness, don't we also have a duty to discern that, to seek that, to accept that? Now, we could put forward a lot of philosophical arguments for the notion that there is a source of goodness. This is what we would call God. But the thing is, the source of all goodness isn't just some vague force or some nebulous whatever kind of entity. It's a personal being. A personal being 
is a being with a will, an intellect, the capacity to know, to make choices, to love. So think about it. I mean, think about what we're saying here. God is the infinite, transcendent, incomprehensibly vast source of goodness. And yet, to accept or to pursue or to desire such a being is also to be in a relationship with it, to love it, and to be loved by it. I mean, a lot of religions and philosophical systems have this notion that there's some sort of transcendent, otherworldly source of existence. But Christianity is one of the few religions that says that you can be in a relationship with it, right? I mean, think about how radical that is, especially when you put that in the context of comparing Christianity to other religions. As a result of all of this, if we will look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2558. It says, concerning the mystery of faith, which is basically the core tenets of the Christian religion, that the spiritual life, and I quote, requires that the faithful believe in it, that they celebrate it, and that they live from it in a vital and personal relationship with the living and true God. This relationship is prayer, unquote. So in a word, the core of prayer, so what prayer is born out of, what it feeds into, is believing in and celebrating the mysteries of faith, which leads us to be in a relationship with God. And you look at paragraph 2565, the Catechism. It says that prayer has a uniquely Christian character to it, because every religion has a prayer, right? And every religion believes that prayer, to some extent, allows us to really meditate upon the truths that that religion believes and to, to some extent, grow in deeper union with it. Paragraph 2565 of the Catechism says that prayer has a uniquely Christian character to it when it, uh, insofar, quote, as it is communion with Christ, unquote. So that's to say, God the Father sent His only begotten Son to save us from sin and to thereby bridge the gap between us and our Creator. It is through union with Christ that we thus have union with the Father. And so prayer is thus something born out of, something that deepens this union with Christ. And thus, if you don't look at Reverend Reginald Gergou Lebrun, who was a very famous you know, French Dominican theologian, I'm a little bit biased because, again, PC, Dominican school, I'm a little bit biased towards the Dominican tradition, but Gergou Lagrange wrote a book on the nature of contemplative prayer. And he said, quote, Prayer is an elevation of the soul to God, by which we will, in time, what God from all of eternity wills that we should ask him, namely the different means of salvation. Unquote. So prayer is a means by which we meditate upon the things of God, and in so doing, desire what God desires that we should ask him for, namely the various tools necessary to grow in union with him. Now, there's, I kind of made reference to the fact that oh, there's a few different types of prayer, right? You know, it's penitential, there's petitionary, there's prayers of thanksgiving. But then there's another way of dividing up the different types of prayer. And not just in accordance with their broad categories, but also with the levels of spiritual or emotional intensity attached to them. You see, the thing is, the spiritual life is a battle between good and evil, right? And the more we overcome evil, and the more we do the good, the more we grow in holiness and virtue. And as we progress in the spiritual life, one of the effects of that is that our prayer also deepens. That our prayer life also becomes more spiritually and emotionally intense. And so there's different levels of prayer in the sense of different levels of intensity 
of both spiritual, intellectual, and emotional intensity with which we partake in prayer. And the type of prayer that I really hope to focus in on tonight is contemplative prayer. But in specific, I hope to kind of talk a little bit about contemplative prayer within the context of the other types of prayer that are kind of laid to it, and also its relationship to love. Because this is something I don't think is emphasized as much as it ought to be emphasized. The relationship between prayer in general and the virtue of love in specific, and, you know, or, or more specifically, contemplative prayer. So prayer in general, contemplative prayer in specific, and love on the other hand. Now, the most, the simplest form of prayer is what is called vocal prayer. And vocal prayer is simply when we say prayers in some sort of verbal way, or think prayers. So, for example, simply, the act of simply reciting the Our Father, or the Hail Mary, or some other symbol, like simply the act of saying a prayer is, and it could be a pre-written prayer, or a prayer that we just sort of say off the cuff. That's, that is vocal prayer. Now, what differentiates vocal prayer from, you know, simply saying the words is the fact that there's also an, an act of faith behind it. You know, we trust that God will answer our prayer in some manner, at some point, to some degree. So verbally saying these prayers with a sense of faith and hope and trust in God is vocal prayer. But the next level of prayer beyond that is meditation. Now, the term meditation, it's, it's a, now meditation is also known as methodical prayer, prayers of reflection, or discursive prayer. And what all these names or titles imply is that prayer, this type of prayer, engages the mind. And I think that's important to really emphasize this fact because the stereotype we all have of prayer, of meditative prayer, is the forms of meditative prayer found in the Eastern religions. And more specifically, I'm thinking about Buddhism. When you look at Buddhism, they believe that our entire vision of reality is false. You know, that our vision of reality has been corrupted by our sins, which then produce bad karma, and so all of our thoughts and all of our feelings are rooted in this sort of illusory understanding of reality. We don't see reality as it really is. And the best way, the number one way to kind of get past the illusion, to pull the veil back, is to empty our mind. Because all the thoughts and emotions that are going on are really just distracting us from reality as it really is. And so, in many of the meditative practices of Buddhism, they attempt to basically, you know, empty the mind of all thoughts. It's not just, oh, I'm focusing on this one thing, and I'm going to get rid of distracting thoughts. They want to get rid of all thought. And at some point, they also hope to get the mind to turn in on itself, so the mind can also have an accurate vision of its own true nature. But a lot of people tend to confuse meditation Christian meditation with Buddhist meditation. They think that's the only form of meditation. But the thing is, Christian meditation doesn't include not thinking. In fact, it includes actively making use of our intellectual capacities. Now, of course, meditation is different than simply the academic study of theology in its broadest sense, because you know, they may have, these two things may have overlapping effects, but with meditation, we're not just using our intellectual prowess to make sense of some lofty or difficult to interpret verse or concept. Rather, meditative prayer often begins with us placing ourselves in the presence of God and allowing this presence to wash over us in some way and using the intellect to delve 
into or explore what results from this. So one popular form of scripture-based meditation is the Lectio Divina. The Lectio Divina, you basically will pick something in the Bible, it may be a single verse, it may be a larger story, a chapter, a parable, but you pick something in the Bible, you read it, and then you sit in silence. And there may be a ver- like a word, a verse, a theme, a, an event, a quality of a character that really just sticks out to us and really just keeps on uh, you know, popping into our head and there's something drawing us to that. So we then explore that theme and think about how does that apply to us and our lives. Uh, and then at the end of this process, we then take whatever we learned and we ask God to help us live it out. Now, Lectio Divina goes back to the Middle Ages. It was developed by medieval monks, particularly of the Benedictine order, kind of developed over the course of history. But Lectio Divina is one type of meditation. Another type of meditation, basically Eucharistic adoration, which Eucharistic adoration in the form that it exists today is also developed in the Middle Ages. But by going to Eucharistic adoration and by thinking about the church's teachings on the real presence, and by thinking about the logical results of that, the fact that Jesus is literally present to us, and thinking about sort of the effects or consequences or implications of that for our life, that's a form of meditation. Now, related to meditative prayer, so it's called effective prayer. Now, effective means of or having to do with the affections, which are the emotions. And basically, with effective prayer, what we do, hope to do is elicit the emotions, so to pray in such a way so as to elicit the emotions connected with love. Now let me be very clear. A lot of people get this point confused. Love is not an emotion. That's something that a lot of people tend to get confused about. The traditional Catholic definition of love is love is the desire for some good. And so love is a desire. Love is fundamentally an act of the will. Now there may be emotions connected with love. You know, think about how, how you feel when your best friend or your spouse comes home from being away at a long vacation or something. So there can be, and there are, emotions connected with love But love in and of itself is not an emotion. But the thing you've got to keep in mind is with effective prayer, effective prayer is a move from the head to the heart. So what happens with effective prayer is we meditate upon the vastness of God's goodness and the vastness of God's love and mercy. And in so doing... This should hopefully elicit a sense of love. Because, like I said before, if love is the desire for some good, and there's different types of goods, both you know, quantitatively, like some goods are greater than others. Like, for example, what's more important? This microphone or this whole building? This whole building, right? What's more important? This pew or the people sitting in it? The people, right? So a living thing is more important than an inanimate object, right? A building is more important than one small specific part thereof. So who or what could possibly be greater than the source of all goodness, right? God. So the greater the good, the more love it should elicit from us. So effective prayer essentially includes placing ourselves in the presence of God's love and mercy and goodness in the, thing, in the sense of we take the time to think about that, just how vast it is, just how much God loves us, just how bad of a sinner I am, but then how much God pours his mercy out onto us, just thinking about God's love and God's goodness and just 
how there's no limits to it. There's no limits to divine mercy, to the divine wisdom. Or we think about specific ways in which the divine love or the divine mercy or the divine goodness has sort of played out in some way in our lives. You can think about, oh, I can think about, I got a job I really wanted, or I got to that school, or I got, um, I found my wife, or you know, I proposed to my wife, and she said yes, or um, something happened, or, you know, I, I'm in the seminary, and I just got approved to move forward in the ordination process. I mean, whatever. You think about some specific way in which divine goodness has played out in our lives, or you can think about it more generally. But we think about it in such a way so as to elicit a specific response on the part of the emotions. So we think about the divine goodness, or a specific way it has played out in our lives, in order to evoke those emotions associated with love and gratefulness. This, in turn, leads to the realization that God's goodness and God's love and God's mercy is so vast that God is always trustworthy, right? That God will never lead us astray. And so, as a result, we can never go wrong in doing what God tells us to do. So, this, so thinking about the vastness of God's love leads us to place our trust in God, which then leads to obedience to God. And then, one of the effects of that is, one of the effects of all of this, so again, effective tale includes thinking about the vastness of God's mercy and love, which then leads to a sense of trust in God, which then leads to greater obedience to God. But we also begin to realize that God's love, because it's easy to think of God just one way or the other, right? So what do we say about Jesus in the Gloria? We say, you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, right? You alone are the Most High. It's easy to think about God just as far away and as like a sort of a benevolent cosmic dictator. But that's not what Christ said. Christ said, well, he did say he was the Lord, and the Bible says that he's the Lord, but he also adds something else. You know, Jesus Christ says, John chapter 15, verse 15, quote, I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know what his master is doing. I have called you friends because I have told you everything that I have heard from my father, unquote. So we become friends with God. Now, how do you reconcile that with the notion of God being supremely, having supreme authority over us? And more specifically, you see texts like Romans chapter 1, verse 1, where St. Paul describes himself as a, quote, slave of Christ Jesus, unquote. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, in which St. Paul describes himself as, quote, a prisoner of the Lord. So how can you be both a prisoner of the Lord, a slave of the Lord, and a friend of the Lord at the same time? Well, when St. Paul describes himself as a slave of the Lord, what he's saying is that God does have infinitely sovereign authority over us, and I am submitting myself to that authority. Yet, when Jesus says, quote, you are no longer slaves, but friends, unquote. Note what follows that. He says, quote, A slave does not know what his master is doing, but I have told you everything that I have heard from my father, unquote. So a master is in charge of the slaves, and so he doesn't have to tell the slaves anything. But what does a friend do? A friend is willing to tell another friend the, intimate, the most intimate parts of his life. There's that level of openness and intimacy and even vulnerability. And that's the entire purpose of that, of the incarnation, of Christ becoming human. That's the entire notion of Christ is still continually present to us in the Eucharist. That's the whole Christian mindset. God communicates himself to us. God is transcendent, but God also 
communicates himself to us. He makes himself known to us. And so the innermost parts of who God is and the life of God, which man needs to know, but doesn't always have the ability to know because of the finiteness of the human mind, God makes that known to us. And therefore he establishes that sense of intimacy and openness and vulnerability. And so there is that notion of Jesus is a spiritual master, but there's also this notion of Jesus as the one who loves us. And he isn't just loving us in that sort of pretend sense when a dictator, you know, decides to take pity on us. He genuinely loves us. And he genuinely has that sense of open... I mean, think about even with the Eucharist. I mean, I'm sure there's people out there who've received the Eucharist who don't really have that much faith, who don't really believe. There's, I mean, there's times in which no one's in the church for hours or days, and he's there, alone in the tabernacle. Or there's been times in which people have, like, done terrible things to a consecrated Eucharist host. So, for the sake of, you know, communicating himself to us, for the sake of you know, making himself more present to us, he creates that level of vulnerability, an eternal, all-powerful God comes down to us. And for the sake of coming down to us in order to unite himself to us and bring us up to heaven, he's willing to endure being alone in the tabernacle. He's willing to endure abuse. He's willing to endure, you know? So he has vulnerability. He has that sense of just openness and putting himself out there for us. And so he's a friend. He's our Lord, but he's also a friend. And so one of the effects or one of the elements of um, effective prayer is not just submitting to the authority of God, though that is one of the effects, but it's also more deeply relating to Christ as a friend. Now, a lot of people may look at contemplative prayer and effective, or rather meditative prayer and effective prayer and go, well, hey, those sound like pretty intense forms of prayer, right? I mean, we saw it off with vocal prayer. Vocal prayer is, you know, the kid, you know, sitting at the foot of the bed, you know, saying those prayers in those little prayer books that we get for, you know, little kids you know, on their first communion. And then it goes from that to having these profound experiences of the divine love. A lot of people go, that's pretty intense, right? Well, there's still another type of prayer even greater than that. That's contemplation. So what is contemplation? Well, contemplation, first and foremost, is quasi-mystical. That's the way a lot of the theologians have described it. It's quasi-mystical in nature. It's not a mystical experience, but it's something similar to or analogous to what you see in a mystical experience. And there's a lot of things that it has in common with a mystical experience. For example, like in a mystical experience, contemplative prayer is passive, right? So, when you're talking about vocal prayer, when you're talking about um, effective prayer, meditative prayer, when you're talking about the Mass or, you know, the various devotions that we take part in, those are things that we do. Or, at, you know, best case scenario, it's something that God does and then we cooperate with it. But that's the least sort of minimum level of participation. Whereas with contemplation, the contemplative state is not something that we can bring about, right? It's not something that we can cause. It doesn't result from our merits. It doesn't result from our actions. We can, at best, prepare ourselves for it or dispose ourselves to it by doing good works, by ascesis, by growing in holiness, But the contemplative state is something that is brought about by the Holy Spirit, giving us His grace, and only by that. 
And that's the most important thing we got to keep in mind. We ourselves do nothing to bring it about. Also, and this gets more to the point, more to the core of what it is, in contemplative prayer, we have an experience of God that goes beyond our normal cognitive ability. So, let me just repeat that again. In contemplative prayer, we have an experience of God that goes beyond our normal cognitive abilities. And basically what that means is there's two types of thinking. There's discursive thinking, and on the other hand, there's intuitive thinking. We all kind of use these terms, right? But unfortunately, in, in sort of popular discourse, they're not always as precisely defined as they should be. So, discursive reasoning basically is like moving from premises to conclusions, right? If A, then B, then C, right? Or it's basically we experience something, we know something, and then we then infer something else from that, but what we conclude, what we infer, is different than the original premise or truth claim that brought about that, right? That's discursive. We move from one truth claim to another truth claim. Intuition is non-discursive thought, right? It's basically when we know things through sort of an immediate, direct vision of it. Intuition is kind of similar to, think for example, um, it's not, I wouldn't say, I'm not 100% sure if the senses would be categorized in this, but it's kind of analogous to what happens when we see things visibly, right? It's like there's this immediate vision of that. Um, or there's certain, there's some moral sentiments that humans have that we know intuitively that are not the result of discursive reasoning. But the thing you got to keep in mind with meditation, with effective prayer, with when we go to Mass and then we think about, we take the time to contemplate what's happening in the Mass, basically, with that, we are, we are, taking the time to think about God, to pray to God, but the mind there is working discursively. With contemplation, the mind is working intuitively. So in a word, contemplative prayer is a form of prayer in which we experience God in a, in a direct, intuitive way. Now, of course, this isn't the same as what happens in the beatific vision. The beatific vision is when we're in heaven and we see God as directly as, as much as the human mind can. But the thing is, with mystical experiences and with contemplative prayer, it's not so much that we're having that direct vision of God, but where God makes his presence known to us in a manner that goes beyond the way in which he normally does. Because think about it. God, in spite of being transcendent, is also imminent, right? His presence permeates all things. And it kind of has to, because that's the only way in which God can bring things into existence and sustain things. Because we're not the cause of our own existence. Our existences are dependent on God. So as a result, God has to somehow make his presence present or manifest among us in order for us to come into existence and be dependent or to continue to be sustained in existence. Now, the thing is, so as a result, the presence of God is all around us at all times. But with contemplative prayer and with mystical experiences, the presence of God is made known to us in a manner more intense than the way it is in our normal day-to-day -day life. So think about it. I mean, God is, all, God is permeating all things. He's present right here. Even if you were to take the Eucharist away, God is still present to us at all times. If you were to take his presence away from us for even a moment, we'd cease to exist. 
But there's a difference between saying, okay, I have to affirm that because that kind of makes sense on a metaphysical view. You know, if I believe God is the creator. But on the other hand, when, if God makes his all-pervasive presence known to us in a way more intense than the way it is now, then that would be a form of contemplation. St. Thomas Aquinas defines contemplation, and again, I love this, St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest theologians in the Middle Ages, but a lot of people think of him as just this stuffy, philosophical, you know, theologian, and on some level he kind of is, but he occasionally has his very almost borderline poetical ways of putting things. He talks about how contemplation is a form of knowing God that is above reason and which is accompanied by a sense of awe. By, think about that for a second. It is a form of knowing God that exists above reason which is accompanied by a sense of wonder or awe. Now, there's a few different types of contemplation. There's natural contemplation, which is, in order to understand natural contemplation, you've got to understand this concept of the transcendentals. The transcendentals, the transcendentals, the basically the concept of being, the concept of existence, the concept of beauty or goodness, basically those ideas that are like the most fundamental elements of reality. And when a person really takes the time to contemplate just how profound the concept of existence or the concept of beauty or the concept of truth or goodness are, and then maybe even to some extent, because God is the source of all things, so maybe to some limited extent contemplating these things and then in contemplating these things, contemplating God, like having some just that, that experience of whoa, this is profound, that would be natural contemplation. But with natural contemplation, we're basically thinking about the concept of existence and thinking about the concept of goodness and beauty and truth to the extent that the human mind can do so. And we think about how these things point towards God, but to the extent that the human mind is capable of doing so. Philosophers and artists in particular tend to exemplify this concept of natural contemplation. There's another type of contemplation that's supernatural contemplation. With supernatural contemplation, that's a form of contemplation in which we contemplate one God directly, but also in a way that goes beyond what people can do sort of apart from grace. So now again, Another distinction. There's two types of supernatural contemplation. There's acquired contemplation, which is basically when we meditate upon divine, the truths of divine revelation, and sort of apply them to our own lives, but in a manner in which the mind is being aided and elevated by grace, right? That is acquired supernatural contemplation. You then have infused contemplation which is basically something that is brought about by the Holy Spirit in which we have this experience and it's not something we do but it's an experience we have in which we feel the presence of God with a particularly intense level of profundity that goes beyond simply adhering to propositions. So let me explain. With reason, we basically are accepting this certain truth claims. We're accepting claims. And that's the same thing happens with faith. We're accepting claims. Now it's claims that go beyond the ability of reason to understand, and thus we would need divine revelation. We need the Bible. We need the church but we're still adhering or assenting to claims, right? To the Trinity, to the Incarnation, transubstantiation, with faith and with reason, where it's propositional. 
right? We are saying, I believe in this set of statements that the Bible and the church and sacred tradition have put forward as things I have to believe for the sake of my salvation. But the thing is, with contemplation, we're not just thinking propositionally. We're not just saying, I believe in God in the sense that I believe in a set of propositions about God. We're experiencing God, the being, who is the revealer of these truths. That's what contemplation is. Now, with contemplation, contemplation doesn't just include being made aware of God. Contemplation also, to an extent, includes a sense of awe. It includes a sense of being just drawn back and just having your mind blown by the profundity, by the magnificence, by the majesty of the divine presence. And what this does is it has the effect of deepening our sense of love for God. Because we're not just thinking about divine love, we're not just thinking about the vastness of God's being, what we know sort of indirectly in these other forms of prayer, we're directly experiencing it. And so this sort of leads to a larger point about the relationship between love and prayer. You see, the thing is, you can't really have one without the other, right? You know, you can't, you can't love what you do not know. Like, let me just, you know, use you as an example. I'm guessing you two are husband and wife. So, if one of you didn't exist, or, or who did exist, you didn't know the other one existed, could you truly say you love them if you didn't know they existed? Why do you know, why do you love them? You first knew them, and then you love them, right? So, let me ask you also. I'm guessing you guys believe in God, right? You also love God, right? But how could you have loved God unless you knew God? Someone had to tell you about this concept of God, right? So, well, here's another example. You saw. What do you, I mean, I'm not a big car guy, but do you happen to have a big car? Or, like, me? Yeah. Um, sure. So, do you mind saying it? Um, I would say if I can afford one, I'd like to have a Ferrari. But what happens if you never saw a Ferrari in your life? Can you make a judgment about that's the best type of car? About that's the most worthy of your respect and like, oh, I just love that type of car. How would you know unless, how could you love it unless you knew it, right? So here's the thing. When, uh, is it any wonder, is it any coincidence that atheists don't love God, but they also don't know God? Like, they don't believe in God, so why would they love a being that they don't believe in? Like, why would they love a being they don't believe in? Or, there's some people who were never really taught, and this, is, this really was not that widespread in the past, but it's becoming way more widespread today, people who don't go to church just because their parents never really raised them in it, right? So people don't know anything about religion. So, at least with the stereotype of an atheist, it's like, oh, well, I know about this concept of God, but I don't believe it. Some people don't even like, they don't really understand the concept of God to begin with. So no wonder they don't really believe in it. Or they don't really love it, right? They don't love it because they don't really understand it. They don't accept it. They don't believe in it. So the spiritual life is like a mountain. At the base of the mountain is people who don't know God and they don't love God. And most people, I mean, I guess you could say the souls in hell know God but they also don't love God. But most people on earth who don't love God also don't really even believe in God. Or, or most people who don't love God don't know God. They don't believe. So it's like, it's not usually born out of mouths. But when you either don't know God, you don't love God, or both, that's the bottom of the mountain. Then you see, like, going up to base camp, a couple of miles up. That's kind of like... A person who goes to church, who says, I believe, but they don't really understand it that much. And when they pray, their prayer is mechanistic. Because 
their, their, their faith is not that deep. Their understanding of the object of faith isn't that deep. Their love is therefore not that deep. I mean, think about the difference between, for example, your spouse or your family members or your close friends or some random guy who lives across the street who you don't talk to. Different levels of intimacy, therefore different levels of love, right? So people who, who love God, who know God in a shallow way, they love God in a shallow way, and therefore their prayer is shallow. Because how can you ever feel moved to express the virtue of religion towards God? How can you ever feel what you feel in contemplative or effective prayer? How can you ever expect to, how can you ever expect to have any desire to contemplate the things of God if you don't love God that much? And how can you be expected to love God that much if you don't know God? If you don't know the vastness, so if you don't know or don't believe in the vastness of God's goodness, you won't love God. And therefore, if you don't love God, you won't pray. If you know God in a shallow way, you'll love Him in a shallow way, and your prayer life will be shallow. But the, but the more you take the time to think about what you believe, the more your love for God will grow, because you'll realize God is the greatest, literally the greatest thing. Like, He's the source of all goodness. He's the source of all truth and all love. There's literally nothing out there better than God. And so the more you understand that, the deeper your love gets. The deeper your love gets, the more you desire to pray. And you won't be sad by simply mechanistically going through the motions. You won't just say the prayers. You also think about what you're saying. You won't just go to church. You'll take the time to think about what happens on that altar every Sunday, right? You'll take the time to actually think about what you're saying and doing when you're praying. And then once you start doing that, you have then start to cross the line into contemplative prayer. Once you start contemplating the things of God, you then start having this strong emotional reaction to it, right? You've crossed the line into effective prayer. And after a certain point, you then become more and more disposed with it. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but hopefully you'll have some sort of profound experience of the divine. But again, that's the end result of this process of deepening your knowledge of God, which is itself the result of this process of deepening your knowledge. So it's a double helix. You can't have one without the other. And the minute you take out one element, the other part falls apart. And the minute you don't have either love or knowledge, you don't have authentic prayer. But the minute you begin to truly dedicate yourself to deepening your knowledge and then seeing the beauty and goodness of God and therefore deepening your love, the more your prayer will be deepened. And in this life, the highest you can get is contemplative prayer, mystical experiences. But with any luck, we will stay true to what God started in this world, in our baptism, and we will end up, hopefully in the next life, taking part in the ultimate form of praising God, the perfect union of love with God and our fellow believers in heaven. Thank you very much. So I know I, I said a lot tonight, but I thought I'd leave open at least maybe 10, 15 minutes, or as long as you want, basically, to take part in some question and answers. Does anyone have any questions, points that they'd like to clarify? Yes? What do you, what do you think of the very novel of the 60s? The monk Thomas Merton, did he have it? Actually, he was very popular at the time of his books after his book. Did he have the comfort to write? Because it was with mysticism kind of told him. Yeah, so that's actually a good point. Um, I myself am not a Thomas Merton scholar, but from what I do know about Thomas Martin, he's a little bit of a, a mixed bag. Uh, it's, it's interesting because I believe he was maybe in his 40s or 50s around the time, or maybe even a little bit older around the time Vatican II happened. And so he was from that whole generation that came of age in Vatican II. And it wasn't those old radical Vatican II people, but 
it's interesting because with the change that came in the middle of the last century, you saw a series of people who were born and raised in the old way of doing things. And yet they experienced this profound shift in their spirituality, sort of midway through life or towards the end of their life. And, it's, and so very often you see both of these elements playing a big influence in the thought of that whole generation not so much the younger generation, but the older generation kind of had elements of both. Um, I remember seeing an interesting photograph of um, Thomas Merton, because he was a monk, and you believe he was at the Trappist order, and so him in a monastery, dressed in his traditional monastic vestments with the tonsil, and doing the elevation in the, I believe it was the elevation, in the Tridentine style, the pre-Vatican II Latin Rite Mass. And, you know, I, I believe it was actually the first Mass he ever celebrated after being ordained. And then I remember seeing another famous picture of him from much later, where he, it was him with the Dalai Lama. And I think those two pictures kind of summarize the mindset of um, Thomas Merton. Now, Thomas Merton, from my understanding, my albeit limited understanding of Thomas Merton, he wasn't as extreme as pe some people who are into like what would be called the, um, I think it's called the perennial truth tradition, which basically says that there's sort of a core uh, spiritual kernel at the center of all religions. Or he wasn't as extreme as people like Richard Rohr, or maybe people like that, or uh, Alan Watts used to be a Christian. He was a, he was a very famous Buddhist thinker. He used to be a Christian, became a Buddhist, but he did kind of still have some level of affinity for, for Christianity. But again, people like that will very often be in radically reinterpret Christianity in light of some New Age or Eastern or non-Christian tradition. Um, in, he, I don't, he did write books on the relationship between Christianity and Buddhism. I'm not sure how orthodox or heterodox or whatever those were. But my initial impression was that he wasn't, in terms of his more general works, he wasn't maybe as extreme as what you see in some other people. But again, that, that would be a question more for a, someone who's more of an expert in Martin. Now, you had mentioned that he had contemplation sort of mixed in with mysticism. There's nothing wrong with mysticism. And I think Christianity in the, in the West goes back and forth between mysticism, just divorced from any kind of dogma, dogmatic theology, and then systematic or dogmatic theology devoid of mysticism. And one side is basically skeptical to no end of the other side. And there's nothing wrong with mysticism. In fact, mysticism is a good thing. In fact, I would say that a Christianity that doesn't have mysticism, or any religion that doesn't have mysticism, is dry, it's boring, and tedious. But we need to realize that how do we differentiate authentic from inauthentic mystical experiences? You need theology. You need to be able to actually take the time to think about what you experienced, right? And so it's not even so much that mysticism is something to be avoided as much as it is mysticism not guided by the truth or mysticism divorced from the truth or mysticism that thinks that oh, all those dogmas, you don't really need that or mysticism that is um, guided by wrong or heretical principles. So that's a balance that you need to keep in mind. So any other questions, comments? Yes? When they had the Dominican prayers, they would just pray out, um, they would do say something in the prayers, the souls in purgatory, the Alpha, the Great, etc. Come again? 
So that's actually a great question. It's, I think this kind of feeds into my previous point because we need to remember that prayer, mysticism, spirituality needs to be accompanied by a sort of very systematic, well thought out view of what the faith teaches and why. And likewise, what the faith teaches and understanding of that should express itself in prayer, in worship, in something spiritual, not just something intellectual. And so with that in mind, I would say that it's easy to, to do two things. It's easy to sort of, you know, be super paranoid of coming off as superstitious, that you actually say stuff that's not quite orthodox. It's also easy to go in the opposite direction and act superstitious. And I think back in the olden days, people had this attitude of, well, if it's because I say a certain number of prayers a certain number of times, like simply the act of doing it, like that's gonna like free a soul from purgatory, but like in the sense that like I'm doing something, like I'm, you know, you're like, like almost like think about this attitude, like I knew someone who said a novena, and you know what a novena is. A novena, there's some types of novenas where you can say it's one, a prayer once over the course of, like once, one time, an hour for nine hours in a row. Sometimes it's once a day, every day for nine days straight. And some, one person had this attitude of, oh, well, I missed a day in my novena, therefore it doesn't count. So I've known people who've had that attitude, and they have this overly mechanistic attitude of prayer and how prayer works. On the other hand, you have to keep in mind that if our prayers don't actually do anything to help the souls in purgatory, what are we doing? Like, why are we paying at all? So, basically, when we pray for the souls in purgatory, like the person on Relevant Radio who said that, it's true. It is a good will. But it's precisely because it's a good will act, it's something born out of love, right? And because it's something born out of love, it love that comes forth from grace, whenever we do anything that results from the grace of God, it builds up merits, right? So when we pray, out of a sense of love, for the souls of purgatory, which manifests itself in, I want them to go to heaven, that's the highest way in which you can love someone, when you express this sense, when you pray out of a sense of love for the souls in purgatory, those merits are applied to the souls in purgatory, which then helps them in the process of purification as before they are released into heaven. Now, it is easy to take that into a superstitious direction. Like, very often, when you say, um, when, they, when they say, oh, you're supposed to say a certain number of prayers, sometimes the number of prayers is meant to be symbolic. Like, three is a symbolic number. Seven is a symbolic number. When you look at the you know, history and world cultures, you'll find a bunch of different levels of spiritual symbolism. Sometimes it's just an arbitrary number. But the reason why they want you to say the prayers more than once is because if you truly care about the souls of purgatory, you will want to pray for them as often as possible. So it's just meant to create this sense of investment, emotional and spiritual investment in wanting to help the souls of purgatory. But it's not, you should not accept this superstitious attitude of, oh, I forgot... I'm supposed to say seven prayers. I forgot to say prayers once. Therefore, it doesn't count. Well, were you praying... Let me ask you this. Were you praying with sincere faith, hope, and charity all the other times? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, then even just saying it once had an effect. Like, let's just say that something happened. I'm praying to the souls in purgatory. Then I die. I can only say one prayer. I'm supposed to say ten. Did my prayers have no effect? They did have an effect. Now, that doesn't mean simply saying it more than once is superstitious, I just, it could be interpreted in a superstitious way, but I think there's a lot of Catholics and a lot of Christians who are too concerned with being judged by the world, so they try to water down certain ways of doing things, or the, the mindset surrounding things, and they're responding to a superstitious attitude that's really born out of the fact that people were not taught properly. Now, I saw you had your hand raised again. Do you have a, like a follow-up question? Or? The first 
Now, on another video, I heard that that is not true. That that is more of a, it's a good will to pray the prayer, but it's not necessarily that it releases that in the soul. And that when we say certain prayers for certain indulgences, that you need to be careful that you don't fall into that repetition of Yeah, and I think there's a few things going on there. I think one of them is thinking that I release those souls from purgatory is me. No, it's God. But the thing is, it's like God's grace is always foundation. You take away God's grace, nothing's ever going to get done. But the thing is, in this case, it's us cooperating with God's grace, if that makes any sense. You know? Yes? Um, you want to get the book of Pre, I don't know if it was around Vatican II time, there used to be days specific to how many um, days of indulgences. So um, you want to look at that. Um, and it's the teachings of the church. That the church teaches that we can do indulgences on behalf of souls that have died, right? Yeah. So that's kind of what we're talking about. And what Cole was saying that to not you know, go so far into um, the superstitious part of things, just be careful. Ultimately, it's your intention with the teachings of the church that give the teachings on indulgences. Whether it's a thousand souls, a hundred thousand souls, that's a private revelation. We leave that up to God. And, that, and that's the thing. That's actually a great point. And just to expand upon that point, back, so as Dennis said, before Vatican II, in these books to other indulgences, they used to say, and so an indulgence is a special blessing from the church where we receive God's mercy in a special way and it reduces our time in purgatory or the more specifically the temporal punishment that we would have to experience in purgatory. Back before Vatican II, they used to say that if you do this thing, say this prayer, you get an indulgence of a thousand, day, day, a thousand days or a thousand years or whatever. But purgatory, like heaven and hell, exists outside of the physical realm, so this, you don't experience the passage of time in purgatory. So when they say you're ten years or a thousand days knocked off of purgatory or something, what that means, well, they're not saying you have less time in purgatory. What they're saying is, well, they are saying you have less time in purgatory. They're not saying you have less days in purgatory. What they're saying is, if you were to do an X amount of days worth of penance uh, with sincere faith, hope, and charity, it would result in you having less time in purgatory. Now, the church eventually stopped talking about indulgences in that way because they thought it was misleading for the average person. So if you see an indulgence book that says, if you say this indulgence, um, then you get a thousand days less time in purgatory, that isn't probably a pre-Vatican II book. And the church, the text that talks about the list of indulgences and what you need to do to get them was revised after Vatican II the, and they replaced the old one. So if, so if it says anything about you get an X amount of time off from post purgatory, just know that that's not the addition the church uses and it's no longer binding. It's no longer efficacious. But the number one thing to keep in mind is one, when you do something to get an indulgence, you're cooperating with God's grace, right? And you, like Dennis said, you can get indulgences on behalf of another, on the souls of purgatory. You can not just get them for yourself, but for others. But again, it's you cooperating with God's grace. It's God's grace that results in them being released. And the notion of a thousand souls being, like, whenever anyone says an X amount of souls will be released if you say this prayer, I tend to believe that that's more a result of popular piety, though I would like to look into that, because I've never seen that in specific. I think it's just the Lucy, right, Dad? Um, St. Gertrude. St. Gertrude. Yeah. So that, again, that's a personal, like a, um, a personal revelation, so it's a devotion. It's not a, an official teaching of the church. And so an important thing to keep in mind is the difference between private revelation and public revelation. So public revelation is those things that God revealed 
that we need to know that absolutely 100% need to be believed in order to make it into heaven. You know, it's public revelations because the intended audience is all of mankind. Now, mystic messages you receive in mystical experiences are what is are called private revelations. They're called private revelations because even though they may have a message that we can all benefit from, the primary audience is the individual or group of individuals that they're revealed to. Now, private revelations, the church may accept private revelations in the sense of saying, okay, this doesn't contradict church teaching, so you're not a heretic by believing in it. But the thing is, it doesn't have the same weight of authority as public revelation, which is passed on and made known to us in scripture and tradition and interpreted by the church. So, like I said, I've heard about getting less time in purgatory, but I've never, I haven't held that revelation of an X amount of souls or release in purgatory. But if the church has approved of that revelation, then basically you're saying, oh, I have more authority than the church to make the judgment about this being true or false. But you have to keep in mind that if it's the result of a private revelation, just note that, one, it's not of equal authority as the Bible or sacred tradition or the teachings of the church. And second of all, we need to realize that the most important thing in, freeing, in saying prayers to free souls from purgatory is the sincerity as caused by the faith, the hope, the charity born out of prayers. And that's what makes our prayers efficacious for ourselves or for others. Does anyone else have any prayers or uh, questions rather? Did you have one or? You're welcome. Does anyone have any que more questions or? Thank Sir? you for your time tonight, Paul. Thank you very much.